Go ahead, Gautier. Hello, everyone. This is Gatwiri Muthara from Compto National. Um, I'd like to, I'm the Membership and Communications Manager, and I'd like to welcome you to our Disability Rights, Our Civil Rights webinar, which is our event to commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, before we begin, I have a few housekeeping rules, so just allow me to share my screen. So all lines have been muted, and I'm seeing that we're having some technical difficulties and everyone seems to be coming in as Christian Kent. I do apologize. Uh, this was supposed to be strictly a webinar with uh, only cameras for the panelists. So if your camera is on, please turn it off. If you are not a speaker, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, and if you have any other technical difficulties, please send a message to the host in the chat box. To submit questions for the Q&A portion of the call, please use the Q&A box. The questions will be answered at the end of the panel discussion. Please note this call is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees. I'd like to thank you for joining us. And next, I'd like to introduce Christian Kent, who is one of the co-chairs of our Accessibility Committee. Christian? Well, thank you very much. And I am here as well. Oh, Martin. Yes, I made it. Martin, that's wonderful. Well, then you know what? I am going to introduce you as our uh, Accessibility Advisory Council co-chair for Compto, uh, Compto, and Martin is uh, uh, is going to be our MC today. Yes, thank you all for joining me and joining us. Um, I apologize, I'm having some rather significant technical difficulties, but I am here and I do welcome you guys um, in joining us for this event commemorating the ADA 30th anniversary, Disability Rights Are Civil Rights. Um, as Christian stated, I am the co-chair of Compto National's Accessibility Advisory Council, and this is a council that was established by the Compto Board of Directors to advise on matters of accessibility. As Compto has grown and changed over time, um, it's recognized the need to involve and um, extend a hand to many different communities and the establishment of this council is yet another effort of recognizing the diversity um, of individuals with disabilities and welcoming them into the Compto family. As a colleague of mine once says, once told me, um, diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. Um, and so in this case, I really feel as though uh, Comto is asking to dance with the population of people with disabilities. So thank you. Um, Martin, are you, are you still there, Martin? I'm sorry, once again, we're experiencing some technical difficulties. Christian, if you could introduce Dr. Frieden, that would be great. Very good. Well, I, I have to say that uh, we are uh, we are very fortunate to have a very distinguished panel of guest speakers today. Um, and uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Frieden, I'd like you to kind of uh, uh, give uh, give your own uh, introduction um, because I think no one will tell your story better than you will. Christian, thank you very much. And uh, thank all of you for being here today. I want to thank the, uh, the council, the uh, uh, association for inviting me and, and giving me the opportunity to share some of my thoughts with you on this 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, and Christian invited me to introduce myself. I, I, I'll say just a couple of things about where where I am and what I do to give you some perspective. I, I actually, the, the, the most pertinent aspect of uh, my being here today is that I happen to be a member of the board of the transit agency in Houston, Texas. And uh, that is a, a, a great honor for me. Uh, I'd like to share with you just briefly how, how I became a member of the board. Uh, a group of advocates 
working on transportation in the 1980s, uh, actually sued the Metropolitan Transit Authority of Houston and Harris County, Texas. And we sued the agency because we knew they were about to buy 300 to 500 brand new transit vehicles. And we knew those buses would last 15 years. And we knew that a large portion of our transit fleet would be inaccessible regardless of what happened to the ADA, which had just been introduced as a bill in the Congress. The transit agency didn't want to purchase these accessible vehicles. They said it was too expensive. They said they could purchase an automobile for each one of the people with disabilities who might be inclined to ride the transit system and save money. They said that we already had a paratransit system in Houston, which we did, basically one of the first in the country, I believe, starting with our first route back in 1979. Uh, but uh, we wanted to be included, and we didn't want the transit agency to purchase 150, 300, 500, however many the already the order was going to be. We didn't want those to be inaccessible, literally for the next 15 years. So, so we sued the agency. They uh, went to court. Uh, we had many, many people with disabilities who got into the streets. Um, made a lot of uh, what we called at the time civil disobedience. We stopped a few buses in the streets. Uh, we filled up the city hall. We met with the transit director. And at some point meeting with the gentleman who was the chairman of the transit agency, I said to him, I don't think you understand. What we're trying to do here is to become part of our community. And to do that, we have to be able to use perhaps what people regard as the most essential community service, and that would be transportation. And the chairman said, finally, he said, I get it. He said, I get it. It's like giving people the right to vote. And I said, rationalize it however you want, but uh, that's generally what we're trying to achieve here. So he went down the next day and they announced that the transit agency would buy buses. He had a lot of influence over the other board members and they voted to do that. We dropped our lawsuit. Uh, the city bought uh, 300 accessible, wheelchair accessible buses before the ADA was passed. Um, the transit uh, chairman actually testified in a congressional hearing on behalf of the ADA bill supporting it. Our mayor testified on behalf of all the communities in America. She was chairman of the National Association of Mayors, and she endorsed the ADA and uh, the Texas delegation then, which, by the way, included the president of the United States, George Bush, was all in on behalf of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So transit has played a large role in the Americans with Disabilities Act, dating back many years. ADAPT, many of you are ADAPT members and familiar with ADAPT. Uh, you know the many contributions that ADAPT made to the ADA. I want to take just a moment right now and uh, share with you a short video that every time I watch this, I get tears in my eyes. For those of you who may have hearing impairments. I'm afraid this particular clip uh, got sent without captioning, and that's, uh, I regret that. Uh, but I'll give you a short uh, description of the video after it runs here. It takes about two and a half minutes, I think. Uh, please roll the tape.
a century ago, contralto Marion Anderson electrified America, singing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. In April of 1939, she hoped to perform here at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. But the Daughters of the American Revolution, who owned the hall, refused to suspend their Jim Crow policy barring black performers. When the facts became known, Eleanor Roosevelt publicly resigned from the DAR. A few weeks later, Marian Anderson accepted the Secretary of the Interior's invitation to perform instead on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. It was a defining moment in the struggle for civil rights. I'm James DePriest, and Marian Anderson was my aunt. I grew up in a home full of three things, love, music, and dreams. Most of those dreams have been realized, and today I conduct orchestras around the world. But I never imagined that one day I'd become a person with a disability. Okay, try, try. At the age of 26, while conducting in Bangkok, Thailand, I contracted polio. Literally overnight, my world changed. Oh, I was still a young conductor with ambition, but suddenly walking was a challenge. Stairs loomed large, and concert halls without ramps were everywhere. As obstacles I'd never noticed before became a part of my daily life, I quickly learned that the intentional walls of discrimination and the physical barriers confronting people with disabilities have the same effect. Both deny access. People do not see us as a person. They are afraid of us because we look different. When people see somebody with a disability, you know, all this stuff kicks in. People's vulnerability about whether or not they might become disabled, or people feeling guilty about the fact that they are not disabled and I am. I don't want that pay. Why should I? I'm a human being like everybody else. I don't want to be treated that way. 13 years after that historic Lincoln Memorial concert, the racial barriers came down here at Constitution Hall. But it took another 50 years for other barriers to fall and it required an act of Congress to make it happen. This historic act is the world's first comprehensive declaration of equality for people with disabilities, the first. The Americans with Disabilities Act was signed by President Bush on the South Lawn of the White House on July 26, 1990. This landmark civil rights law gave people with disabilities the same legal rights that other minorities had fought so hard to achieve. Discrimination against people with disabilities is now illegal. Again, thank you very much for that. I, I apologize to anyone with a hearing impairment who may not have been able to uh, gain the full benefit of the video. Uh, if you'll send me an email, I'll be glad to send you a printed transcript. Uh, the video was narrated by a gentleman whose aunt, Harriet Edelman, was prevented in 1939 from singing in Constitution Hall, later invited by the president to sing at the Lincoln Memorial, and that was regarded as one of the defining moments of the Civil Rights Act. Uh, that many people would say led to the Americans with Disabilities Act. James Dupreece, my friend who happens to be an orchestra director and who is the nephew of Harriet Edelman, became disabled in his career and uh, he was one of the great advocates for the Americans with Disabilities Act. Transit has played an important role, but I think we have much more to do in transit. Um, when we first presented, and you can see a photograph of, uh, of uh, me handing the report toward independence to then Vice President Bush, 
Uh, when we first presented that report to the vice president, we said, uh, we hope you will support us uh, because we want to see people with disabilities included in everything that we do as, in America. And we want to be included and we need to have an inclusive uh, society. And uh, that message, I think, rang true for many people. So in 1990, after ADA passed, we had an election in Houston for mayor. The man who had rejected our efforts to get accessible transit in Houston was one of the people running for mayor. And he was running against a young African-American man uh, named Sylvester Turner. Mr. Turner had been a state legislator. Uh, the disability community identified with Mr. Turner and he with us. And we all rallied to support uh, Mr. Turner's efforts to become mayor of Houston. He had promised us that if he became mayor, he would appoint a person with a disability to the transit board and to other key positions in our, in our city. Unfortunately, uh, the other candidate won. And uh, it took a long time for Sylvester Turner to come back and be mayor. That was 1990. In 2016, uh, Sylvester Turner was elected mayor of our city after all those years. He called me a week after he was elected and said, Lex, I made a promise to you and the disability community a long time ago and I want to fulfill that promise. I'd like you to be a member of our transit board. And he appointed me, and he's appointed people with disabilities to many other positions in our community. So I guess the message that I have for you and what I've learned through the years of advocacy is we need to have leaders. We need to have strong leaders. Each one of us has to assume our responsibility as an advocate and as a leader, we can't sit still. We have to move forward. We have to see what the next on the horizon brings. Right now, transit is providing a lot of services to people in COVID and uh, that's important. And we will provide more services once this pandemic has gone away. Uh, but what I think many of us don't understand is that people with disabilities still can't use transit regardless of whether there are special signs and special ramps and special places to sit our wheelchairs and so on. We can't use it because we can't get down the sidewalks from our home to the bus stop. But we can't use it because the, the schedules are not fully accessible to us. We can't use it because some of the new technology doesn't accommodate us. We have uh, many, many problems to face and many problems to solve. If we stand up together, if we rise up, if we choose to advocate, if we choose to lead, uh, we can create a new version of accessible transit. We can re we can recreate together the vision of an inclusive community. Obviously, it's more than transit, but transit leaks everything together. We know that. Uh, that's why we all are committed uh, to serving in the roles that we do. And uh, I encourage everybody here to realize that you yourself are a leader that others will follow when you set the pace, when you step forward, when you agree to take up the reins of leadership in a local group, an association, a club, um, we all must have a voice working together and our voices together can make change. We can change our communities and we can change our country and we can change our world. So please think back to the history of the ADA to those people who put themselves in front of the buses to stop the buses and make people realize that we were not included. Today we're part, late, part way there and I encourage you all to, to work together toward a future that is fully inclusive.
Thank you for having me. I hope that I have the opportunity to answer some questions later. Dr. Frieden, thank you so much for those remarks. Um, you know, one of the reasons why Compto created the Accessibility Advisory Council was because uh, the, the, um, the goal to be fully inclusive is something that has to be continually reaffirmed. You know, even with all the history and the examples that have been given, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, as situations change around the world and in our country, um, and uh, you know, some issues uh, rise up in front of others that uh, inclusiveness is not always something that happens continuously. It has to be continually reaffirmed and worked on uh, in order for it to last. Um, one thing I would like to do, and I was remiss, is, is not to introduce uh, the key player uh, from Comto's leadership that uh, that conceived of and, uh, and and approved the establishment of our council, and that is our president and CEO Brad Mims. And uh, Brad, uh, I would really appreciate it if you would say a few words for us. Okay, uh, thank you, Christian, and uh, it is indeed a pleasure uh, for me to uh, to address all of you and address this. Uh, great body uh, this afternoon. And good morning to people who are in other uh, time zones. Uh, again, Comto's pleased to host this webinar to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act. In the 30 years since ADA was passed, uh, we've seen a lot of progress when it comes to creating a country where people with disabilities are allowed the same opportunities as everyone else. But as Dr. Uh, Frieden, uh, let us know there's still a ways to go. According to the uh, 2010 census, uh, people with disabilities make up 19% of the US uh, population, but as we have rounded to, uh, tw to the 2020 census, we are uh, confident that every indicator will point to uh, that number being a greater number. So while we celebrate uh, progress, uh, we also recognize that there's still a lot of work to do Comto's commitment to people with disabilities remains strong through the work of our accessibility committee, which, uh, and, and I had a key role in creating to ensure uh, that the transportation needs of people with disabilities are incorporated into Comto's constituency. Uh, accessibility and uh, innovative mobility is featured prominently uh, at our national meeting and training conference with its own track which explores technology and innovation, uh, the contributions to a more accessible transportation landscape. In addition to ensuring accessibility to people with disabilities, Comto seeks to level the playing field regarding employment and contracting opportunities for folks with uh, disabilities. Comto's 50th anniversary is right around the corner and we will uh, that hopefully with COVID out of the way, uh, we will continue our mission to ensure opportunities and maximum participation in the transportation industry for minority individuals, veterans, MWDBEs, businesses, and people with disabilities. So uh, we're looking to hear and see that uh, stories are shared or personal anecdotes around ADA, uh, around ADA. And I just, as a personal note, again, I was a young uh, congressional staffer on Capitol Hill when uh, the ADA legislation was, uh, was passed and enacted. And I'll tell you, it was, uh, I, I, you know, having the vision to see where we are now uh, was, was, uh, was great. But I'll tell you, uh, people like uh, Dr. Friedman and others who, of you who are in the, in, uh, in the community have done a yeoman's job in making sure that uh, the issue stands paramount in making sure that uh, people with disabilities are included in everything in every part of our society. So with that, thank you for uh, participating this afternoon. And again, we look forward to uh, a great program.
Thank you, Brad. Um, now I am hoping to turn over the program to Martin Carithi, uh, our co-chair. Okay, um, so technical difficulties. Um, in that case, uh, perhaps um, uh, we we should um, we should continue on with um, the introduction to the next panelist. Um, and I'm pleased to introduce uh, Miss Donna Smith, who I've known for many years uh, in the industry. Um, particularly from her work with Easter Seals Project Action. Donna, if you would do the same uh, as Dr. Frieden and introduce yourself. Thank you, Christian. And thank you, Comto, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. I'm very honored to be here today. I'm Donna Smith, and I am the Manager of Accessible Services for Sound Transit. Sound Transit is a regional transportation provider in the Puget Sound region of Washington State. Um, and I've been there for about two years now. <clears throat> My career, though, spans 41 years. And that is split almost exactly half between initially working within the field of disability services and advocacy, and then second in the field of transportation and accessible transportation in particular. So I started out uh, doing things in direct service work, um, working with people with intellectual disabilities and then with people with psychiatric disabilities to learn how to adjust from living all or most of their lives in an institutional setting to uh, learning the daily skills they needed to be able to to live and work and and uh, thrive within the community um, and part of that was always how to use the local transit bus. So long before I knew what travel training really was as a profession, um, I uh, worked with people to be able to get to where they needed to go to take care of business and for leisure activities um, using the local public transit system, whatever was available. Um, I then started building up my career in training and technical assistance around legislation that has an impact on the lives of people with disabilities. So things like the Rehabilitation Act, Fair Housing, Air Carrier Access Act, um, and then after 1990, focusing primarily on the Americans with Disabilities Act and its implementing regulations. In 2002, I got the opportunity to take all of that training and technical assistance work to a national scope project. That's when I started working for Easter Seals Project Action as a training and technical assistance specialist. And I had 16 years there um, to work with transit agencies all around the country. And this really helped me in many ways to understand the perspective of what it means to provide accessible transportation from the transit industry side. I certainly knew the issues both personally and professionally um, with regard to what people with disabilities needed in the way of transit. But now I was working with the transit side to say, so what are our solutions? And so I had many years of working with transit agencies, large transit agencies serving metropolitan areas and down to very, very rural systems. One of them had uh, one bus that was finally donated to their community and they had a volunteer driver doing the best they could to provide rides to people who needed it. And this gave me the opportunity to really work with both the disability community and the transit industry to come together in a community to say, here's what the needs are, and here's our approach to trying to address those needs and really getting on a path that's going to improve that. Um, so thank you, all of you, for teaching me those lessons over those 16 years. And then now I'm learning um, the lessons from how you apply this from within a public transit agency. And not only as it applies to the delivery of service, but how does it also apply to the expansion of transportation? So building out new facilities, new programs, purchasing new vehicles, and putting that out on the road. And what can we do to make that uh, more accessible uh, to more people within our region? <clears throat> so 2020 is a 
we will all remember for the hard lessons that we're learning uh, both about how to live within a pandemic um, and also to live during the civil unrest that's caused by the extreme inequity in our justice system for people of color. Um, at the same time, it gives us a new lens through which to assess our progress in eliminating systemic discrimination and what still needs to be done to make that really happen. So I was 31 when the ADA was passed into law. And so my experience uh, is both pre-ADA and post-ADA, and I'm gonna share a few examples. I started working in my first real job after college at the age of 20, but I was in my mid thirties before I could reliably go to a job interview and not be asked personal and quite frankly, very demeaning questions about how I could possibly be effective as an employee, as a blind person. I rode my first public transit bus when I was 16, and that always makes me smile because this was a rite of passage for me, right? Just like uh, people who get their driver's license. I now had wheels, and they were the city bus wheels, so I could get around. But I was in my early 40s before buses that I rode consistently used automated enunciators to call out the stop so that I would know where I am along that route and to give me route identification information so that I was sure I was getting on the right bus. I have voted in every major election and most of the other elections since I turned 18, but I was 48 before I was able to exercise my constitutional right to cast a private and independent vote by using an accessible voting machine. So as you can tell, just from these few examples, it really takes years for this kind of change to occur. Civil rights laws are passed uh, only after it has been proven that widespread discrimination has occurred and whatever society is doing currently is not gonna fix it. But the law and the implementing regulations are just the starting point. What is really needed is for society to get educated about what it really means to have a disability rather than what you as an able-bodied person thinks it might be like if you should all of a sudden not be able to see or walk. Alice Walker, who is uh, one of the most expressive people with the English language I have ever uh, had the opportunity to uh, be aware of, uh, says it much better than I can. She says, I think we have to own the fears that we have about each other. And then in some practical, some daily way, figure out how to see people differently than the way we were brought up to. So I really think that that's the, the key to having a more equitable and inclusive society. And I'm happy to be here on the panel to, to chat about it today. So Christian, I'll give it back to you. Donna, we're so happy to have you here today. And, and your words uh, are, are so, so uh, inspiring because they're so true. Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking more uh, with you and Dr. Frieden and our next speaker after, after he uh, concludes his remarks, we are taking questions from the audience. I would like to remind everyone that um, on your Zoom um, control panel, there is a Q&A button uh, at the bottom of the screen where you can, uh, uh, you, you can submit your questions and we will be uh, presenting those to, uh, to our fantastic speakers. And so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the esteemed Atoro Jackson. And Atoro, I'm gonna treat you like everybody else and ask you to tell your story. Th thank you, Christian, I appreciate that. And uh, first of all, thank you to Compto for hosting this uh, wonderful uh, event uh, celebrating the 30th anniversary of the uh, ADA. And I am honored to, to be here today and to uh, be speaking with, with you all and to be a part of such a distinguished, uh, distinguished panel. Uh, I'm Arturo Jackson and I'm uh, here in Houston, Texas, a nice summer resort town, uh, nice and cool. I think it's 98 degrees outside today, soon to be a little over 100. Uh, so we're, we're trying to stay warm. 
uh, trying to stay cool. And so I hope that every one of you is staying safe during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, time. I know that it is a, a challenge for everyone, uh, but as many people have said before me, uh, together uh, we'll get through this uh, and be better for it when we come out on the other side. Um, I'm a person with a disability. I'm a native Houstonian. Uh, I was injured in an off-season football accident at a local high school here in uh, Houston. A guy fell on my back and broke my spinal cord at the age of uh, seven, 17. Uh, I was playing four different sports at the time. And uh, one day you go into a, a weight room to lift weights and the a uh, few minutes later, you're carried out on the stretcher and you're faced with life. Uh, but you have to deal with life on uh, in many different circumstances. I did my rehab work over at a place called uh, TIER, uh, the Institute for Research and Rehabilitation here in Houston, Texas. It's where uh, many people go. It's one of the finest hospitals in the nation. Uh, Dr. Frieden uh, has been part of uh, making it a great hospital here in uh, Houston. Uh, Congresswoman Gabby Gilf Guilford uh, went there also and did her rehabilitation work and many other people have also. I was able to go back to uh, graduate with my uh, high school um, and graduated high school, went on to the University of North Texas, uh, graduated there and moved back to Houston and was living over in the medical center like I was a doctor. And uh, my friend, uh, my best friend was coming visit me over in the medical center and we were relaxed by the pool uh, until his dad stopped by one day and said, you know, you don't even have a job. You're not even a doctor. Why are you living in the medical center? Why don't you get yourself a job? And I took his advice and I came over to the Metropolitan Transit Authority of Houston and I got the job I had dreamed about all of my life. Uh, a part-time customer service representative making $7.25 an hour here, here in Houston. And who would have thought that uh, I would be here 31 years later serving as the senior director of uh, paratransit, uh, contracted services, and uh, microtransit services here at, 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 in Houston Metro. And that's, you know, my story is probably a little different from many of you, but for those in transportation, not many of us dream that we would be working in the transportation uh, industry. And, uh, but we find ourselves in here. And once we get into this industry, uh, we find that it is so, so, so rewarding to be able to help people uh, get, meet their transportation needs. And so here at Metro, uh, again, overseeing the paratransit service uh, has been a wonderful uh, experience for almost the last 31 years. Uh, Donna quoted Alice Walker. I'll quote a, a famous golfer, Lee Trevino. Lee Trevino said that you don't know what pressure is until you're playing golf for $100 a hole and you only have $20 in your pocket. That's pressure. You better win. And so you guys may not fully appreciate what pressure is until you try to deliver services with a gentleman in Houston who helped write the Americans with Disabilities Act. Your margin for error is very, very uh, little. But we were also very fortunate that folks like Dr. Frieden and Jim Laughlin and others in Houston helped us develop our paratransit system, as he pointed out, in 1979. So when I started working here at Metro in 1989, uh, our paratransit system was well developed and, and doing well. And in 1990, the ADA came into law and we had to meet the uh, strict requirements of the ADA. And we had the expertise of folks like uh, Dr. Freed and others to help guide the way. But we also had a, an established disability community and we had a relationship with that community and we still have that relationship with that community. Uh, on yesterday, we had a conference call with community leaders from the Lighthouse for the Blind, the Houston Center, uh, the Houston Center for Independent Living, uh, the Council for the Blind, 
uh, the Living Hope Wheelchair Association, so many different groups that we were talking about uh, how we're going to make it through COVID-19 uh, successfully. And so that's really important. It goes back to what we talked about at the beginning. It's not just about uh, being invited to the dance, but it's in being invited to dance at the dance. And so that's what inclusion is all about in getting people involved. And so in 1990, when we were receiving calls from transit, a transit agencies across the nation as to, you know, how did you guys do it? How are you going to do it? Uh, it was, it was a fun time and uh, a learning time. And over the years, we've been able to continue to develop our services. Uh, we have one of the largest pair, the largest in Texas and one of the uh, largest in the nation. We carry over uh, 2 million passenger trips uh, a year. Uh, we have, uh, I think about 400 vehicles out on the streets, about 600 uh, operators that are delivering those services. And it's a, it's, it's a good thing, 2 million calls. We receive more calls in our paratransit department than we do on our bus and rail system combined. Uh, we also receive more customer commendations uh, because again, we're encouraging people to not only uh, come to the dance, but dance. Tell us what we're doing right, tell us what we're doing wrong. Be in, invited, be included in uh, uh, the services that we provide. Uh, our paratransit systems are some of the most, is, is viewed as one of the most cost effective in the nation. That's again, because of the history. That's because of our talented folks that we've worked with. That's uh, also because of the, the, the leadership here at Houston Metro and across the city of Houston. Uh, people are invested in the community. Who would have ever thought that we had folks that were not so much in favor of accessibility within the transportation system. But how many of you can guess what Metro's number one priority here is now? As we prepare for our budget submittal uh, this year, Metro's number one goal is universal accessibility. It's not only meeting the uh, requirements of the ADA, but now under Dr. Frieden's leadership and our CEO and other board members, we wanna know what can we do to now exceed the ADA? What can we do to make our sidewalks, our streets, our infrastructure accessible and friendly? Because people see what a value it is uh, to, to uh, making sure that everyone can live full and product productive lives. Part of my responsibility is in Metro's contracted services. We have over $400 million in contracted services. And as our uh, Compto president talked about, we want to make sure that we give small businesses an opportunity to participate in those and minority businesses to participate on those contracts. At Metro, we have a 35% goal to make sure that everybody is included. We also try to reach out to uh, contractors uh, that uh, are operated by people with disabilities to make sure that they have an opportunity to participate on those uh, contracts also here at Houston Metro. And finally, we have what's called micro transit services, where again, you have underserved populations, underserved communities. And so what we try to do is get in there and provide transportation options for those individuals uh, and make sure that all of our vehicles are wheelchair accessible, that they have uh, technology on them to assist people with uh, uh, visual impairments or hearing impairments. And so we wanna make sure that we're fully inclusive and that we're doing everything to make uh, Houston the most accessible city uh, in the nation. And so I'm proud to, to be a part of this, uh, this program. I'm proud to be a member of Compto uh, and uh, Compto's doing great things. Uh, we have a great chapter here in uh, Houston that's active, uh, giving out scholarships, uh, helping youngsters understand the role of getting into transportation Again, when I came here at age 22, uh, who would have known that I'd be an old, bigger, balder man uh, now and just as happy as I can be. My wife and kids ask me, Dad, why don't we go other places? Why would I ever leave Houston? It's a great place to live and to raise your family and uh, the quality of life is great. So with that, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Kristen 
and the rest of the folks, and I look forward to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Uh, Arturo, can you all hear me? Yes. All right. Lord have mercy. I finally made it to the party. Um, thank you all for waiting for me. Let's move on to some questions here. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to put one out there to uh, the panel um, sort of in line with what Arturo was just talking about um, about employment and opportunity um, what and and maybe to Donna because um, you discussed a little bit about um, transportation and how it impacted your opportunities um, and bettered them but can you speak to what employers employees um, the Compto family can do to promote employment and professional opportunities um, within the transportation industry for people with disabilities? Sure, and thank you for that question. It is a, it is a, a great focus and I'm glad to hear that this is something that Compto uh, intends to pursue. Um, so I think it starts with uh, having an existing work for um, that gets educated on the impact of disability in people's lives, what the real impact is, and, and what, uh, what we need to uh, be able to have in the workplace um, would be people that work in the hiring, recruiting part of the, of the, of the company that uh, our strengths and what we can do and how that can be employed within the agency to do the work that needs to be done rather than fretting over and, and spending way too much time considering how it is that I might do something as a blind person, um, talk to me long enough to figure out that I can do what you need to have done and then, um, and then give me the opportunity to do that. So I think that there's always the attitudinal piece. The other piece that I think is really critical, and this one is harder, believe it or not, um, is you have to look at the systems that you use within your agency to run your business. And I'm talking about all the different types of software that you may use um, to, uh, to do things, everything down from the, the web-based uh, timesheet software that you might use to your file sharing programs um, to make sure that those are indeed accessible um, to people who use assistive technology on their computers. When I talk to my friends and colleagues around the country who have disabilities and who are in the workforce, one of the things that is most likely to push them out or to keep them from being able to be promoted or into the work that they really want to do is that the systems in place to do that work aren't accessible. And so I think we've done a pretty good job with our physical structures, our buildings. Uh, that's all built into the building codes now. Um, but we have a lot of work to do in our digital and in, in the, um, in the systems that we use. So I, I'd like to see that as a focus. Dr. Frieden, would you like to comment on that one? I appreciate the opportunity. I would second what uh, Donna said. I mean, I think she's right on target. I think those are the, you know, the steps forward. And uh, I, you know, I think we all just need to get on board. Fantastic. Uh, what about this notion that disability is just a natural part of human diversity and that people with disabilities are just part of our community? They're our neighbors, friends, colleagues. Um, and what kind of things are you all doing or seeing being done about engaging people um, with disabilities in transportation, in this COVID environment, or in any other kind of um, on any other kind of issues. Arturo, do you want to take that one? Sure. It, it, as far as opportunities, uh, again, I think that it's important. I, th I think that's the key is, is opportunities, giving people the opportunity to, uh, to participate uh, as it relates to COVID-19. 
it's, it's a challenging uh, time for uh, all of us. And I think that it's important that we support one another. Uh, look, it's really important that we look for ways to help people, to engage people, to communicate with people, to focus on those things that uh, what we can do versus what we can't do. Uh, we are, uh, for example, here here at Houston Metro, we, we, we actively seek out uh, people with disabilities to be a part of our company uh, and to uh, employ those individuals. And I would hope that Compto would continue to go on to the high school campuses and uh, the college campuses and talk about transportation and talk about the opportunities. Many people don't realize, uh, even employees, once they get here within, when our group understand the different opportunities that a transit agency uh, provides, whether it be marketing, communications, IT, uh, real estate, engineering, uh, benefits, HR, there's just so many different opportunities. Uh, and again, as we go through COVID-19, we're having to, to focus on what are we doing now, but how are we going to look in the future? What things are we going to need to put in place to support people uh, as we move forward? And so uh, it's a challenging time, but again, it's a time full of opportunities because things are changing and we will change accordingly and we'll, we'll come out better for this. Uh, in Houston, we're, you know, for example, we're, we're not carrying as many people. So now we're carrying <laughs> groceries. We're carrying PPE to people. We're now taking uh, things to individuals to help them during this difficult time. We're spending a little extra uh, few minutes socially distancing and talking to those people and making sure that they're okay. Uh, we're setting up community conference calls to give people an opportunity to talk with us and to socialize with us so that they don't give in to uh, isolation and despair. There are a lot of things that, that we can do. And again, it won't touch everybody, but if it touches two or three or 10 people, that's worthwhile. Hey, Martin, I'd, I'd like to add to uh, what Mr. Absolutely. said and uh, to comment on the question that you asked. I, you know, I think the idea that people with disabilities are just part of the society is a great idea. It feels good. That's what we want to achieve. We want to uh, to be like everybody else and be treated like everybody else. But quite honestly, we're a long way away from that. And I think if people with disabilities sort of lighten up and say, well, we've achieved a lot. We're going to go with the flow. Uh, aren't we, you know, ha haven't we achieved our rightful place in society? Uh, I think we've missed, uh, we've missed the boat because as technology advances, it will advance according to those who are advancing it. And until people with disabilities are fully integrated, until we are included in all industry and in all society, those who lead the change are not going to be led by people with disabilities and therefore we will be in a position of catching up, catching up, catching up. So we really need to press hard on this idea of engagement with industry, throughout industry, throughout the economy. We need to be involved in all activities. We need to raise ourselves up, but we need to raise up people of color. We need to raise up people who are young. We need to raise up older people who are being set aside in nursing homes when if we had the right kind of community-based supports and services, those older people could be living in their own home and benefiting from our transit services and being more of a part of the community. And people with disabilities should have access to those kinds of community-based services and supports beyond transportation. So we, we have to be a little careful about saying we've achieved inclusion, now we're part of society. Because every time we turn around, we're gonna see that we've passed a barrier, but when we turn back around, there's another one in front of us. We just have to stay vigilant, we have to stay active, and we have to be part of promoting not only ourselves, but raising up people of color, raising up young people, and ensuring that everybody, every subset uh, that is 
discriminated against historically and may well be discriminated against today are raised up together. Very poignant, very poignant on many levels. Um, thank you, thank you all. Let's let's turn to some of our questions from our audience. Um, I'm going to turn to my colleague Lena Argon. Um, do we have some questions in the Q and A box? Yes, Martin. We do have lots of questions from um, the mem the public. So we're going to start um, answering those questions. Please. Um, be patient, we're getting through all of them as time permits, but if we do not get to answer your question, rest assured we will keep it to try to submit an answer uh, later to you. So our first question comes from John Reina. John asks, is there any concern that the current administration will attempt to dismantle the ADA in the negotiations for any future stimulus packages? Should we be worried and what can we do? All right, who wants to take that? <laughs> uh, this is Donna, I'll start. I think we always have to be worried about uh, any, um, any possibility that uh, rights that have been given can be weakened or taken away. Um, and, you know, and, until it really becomes a firm part of how society thinks and therefore how society reacts to and treats people, um, that we always have to be concerned about the, the basis that currently gives us the legal right to, um, to press for inclusion and equal treatment. Um, so I, I think that is always a concern. Um, I, I believe it is a concern now. I think that there's been some evidence um, to that effect based on some of the things that we've seen happen within the special education space. Um, and in healthcare, um, and so uh, yes, I think it, I think it's always a concern, and we always need to be vigilant. Um, these were hard-won rights in the first place. They it is a continuing battle, uh, as uh, Lex was saying earlier, to continue to uh, to fight for the next thing to be done, uh, and um, and so I, I think that uh, vigilance is is definitely called for. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's right on point. Um, we're not, we didn't get to the ADA by accident. It was a lot of hard work on the part of a lot of people. So um, it's going to take you know, a lot of hard work to continue to keep what we have in place in place and um, keep moving forward. Thank you. Lena, do you have, uh, you got another one in there in the queue? Yes, as I said, we have plenty of questions. So moving along, we have uh, Judy Shanley asking us um, another question. Uh, Judy, thank you for your nice comments. She's thanking us uh, for this uh, panel, which is, uh, and for our hard work. Thank you so much for that comment. And she says, I am a believer of right sizing the right transportation service for each rider. When I work with some colleagues in and out of the transit industry, they often think that a disability label of any kind automatically suggests that this rider needs paratransit. How do we educate the field on others that there might be more appropriate and less restrictive transportation options? That's a good one. Arturo, how about, how about we direct that one to you? Well, it, thank you so much for, for the question. And it's definitely a, a challenge and I think it's important to create the culture all, all, all throughout the uh, community and throughout the uh, transit agency, uh, that it's about options. It's about what works best for the customer in meeting their transportation needs. Uh, obviously, when you operate a transit agency, you have one pot of money and that pot of money has to support everyone. Um, uh, all the different modes of transportation, whether it be bus or rail or paratransit services making sure that what we talked about earlier, things like making sure that the infrastructure is supportive of people with disabilities. And again, an, in, uh, so a good infrastructure not only benefits people with disabilities, it benefits the guy on the bicycle, it benefits the mom with the stroller, it benef benefits the person with the, the shopping cart that's trying to go places. So again, making sure that we have a good uh, support system, a good infrastructure, 
so that people have options. And uh, again, one size doesn't fit all. One option doesn't fit uh, everyone. On a great day like today, people may be able to use uh, the, the, the local bus system. Tomorrow, they may be going to a different place. The paratransit service may be more of an option. And what we have to do is create that flexibility. But again, it starts with communication. It starts with culture. It does uh, opportunities, travel training, uh, that Donna has been so instrumental in making sure that you do everything possible to help people live full and independent lives. Again, I tell people that on uh, January 12, 1984, I had no thoughts of uh, being a person in a wheelchair, but on January 13, 1984, I became a person in a wheelchair. Situations happening, you never know when you'll find yourself in a different situation, and people never know when they're family members. So again, we have to create uh, a culture, we have to communicate, uh, we have to provide opportunities for everyone. Um, give people choices. Fantastic. Lena, let's try one more and then um, looking at the clock, we probably ought to wind down. Okay, so we're going to um, take this question that Tony sent us um, and he's asking for some resources. And um, Tony says, as a public agency traffic and ITS professional, I am always juggling budget limitations to construct and maintain the bare minimum requirements which now includes ADA compliant ramps and push buttons. But we can't seem to go far beyond that. Are there any available resources and grants we can leverage for expansion of our accessible roadway network? That's a, that's a good question. Um, Dr. Fried, do you wanna take this one and maybe from the perspective of, you know, meeting the minimum standards and trying to exceed uh, those standards in the design and infrastructure of our transportation network. Martin, I, I, you know, quite frankly, I think most people with disabilities would like it if we just reach the minimum standard. Um, it, accessibility is a real challenge for many of us. Uh, and uh, in terms of exceeding that standard, I think what our objective should be is to ensure that people with disabilities have really equal access. And that means identifying those kinds of functions and, and uh, roles that the internet plays that we uh, are frustrated by from time to time. If you're not aware of the W3C, and if you're in the IT industry, you probably are, but uh, I have a lot of respect for our colleagues at W3C who are working always to uh, improve the advisories about uh, uh, accessibility on, on the net. I also think that there may be funding available through the Department of Transportation if people will petition the department. I, a lot of times we wait for somebody to offer us funding. I think if a, if a committee wrote a letter to a, a member of Congress who's on the Appropriations Committee or to the committee staff, uh, there might be consideration for targeted funding in uh, future uh, funding action. Uh, and I think, frankly, that the department may already have funds available that if they receive the appropriate kind of request, they may be able to uh, pull apart to provide some kind of a demonstration or pilot. So I encourage you to look for opportunities, but also look for local opportunities and funders. Um, we have to make advancements and we can only do so through uh, exploratory grants and work that we're doing and if you have a great idea then don't drop it make sure you put it out in the public domain so others can join you in pursuing uh, the, the advancements that you imagine and this is donna i would just add to that that i think that uh once we start designing in access from the start, the cost goes down tremendously rather than always having to retrofit. And I know that 
small and large places have uh, have been strapped for this kind of funding over time, and it's even worse now with our tax base shrinking um, and other demands and, and the actual uh, fair revenue that we receive uh, is shrinking as well. And so we're, we're all dealing with tighter uh, budgets at this time and perhaps less sources of um, of funding opportunities. But one of the really exciting things that I think that we have to look forward to um, in terms of accessibility is the opportunity now to move forward building in accessibility from the start and not just limiting ourselves to the minimal requirements of the ADA, although as, as Lex said, some of us are really happy to have those minimal requirements met for sure. Um, but we can, we can do so much more than that. And it's really just about not increasing the cost of the design of whatever you're doing, whether you're laying new sidewalk, designing a new intersection, building a new rail station. It's not about um, it's about looking at how you're spending the budget that you have for that in the first place. And in the design process, can you build in more features that are going to make that station more accessible to more people um, and, and use that money more wisely, I think, in terms of creating access. But if we're always playing catch up, if access is always the last thought, or the afterthought after something is done, you're like, oh, hey, wow, we should have made this more accessible, then it's always gonna cost more that way. It's fantastic. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's a real key point is that accessibility and access needs to be um, included in the forefront um, as part of the early stages and not a concept where we go back and retrofit things. Um, it really misses the mark and, and misses some of the opportunity that you all have discussed here today. I want to thank the three of you guys for joining us. Um, you guys had some really excellent comments, um, thoughts, perspectives to share with our audience. Um, I appreciate Dr. Frieden's taking us back. Um, I think it's important sometimes to reflect on where we've been um, and then kind of look at where we're where we're headed um, so as uh, as we conclude i want to thank the three you all for for joining us i want to thank the audience for taking the time to join us i want to thank my two co-chair colleagues christian kent and lena aragon um, for the work and assistance on setting this up as well as uh, leading this accessibility advisory council along with myself. Um, for folks who want more information about the Compto Accessibility Advisory Council, um, you can reach out to any number of us or Compto National. Um, reach out within your chapters. Um, join the chapter if you're if you're not uh, currently a Compto member. Uh, we would welcome you in. Um, this is you know the start of perhaps more opportunities for us to have these kinds of conversation and engagement opportunities um, going forward as we find ourselves in this current situation where we're distanced from one another. It gives us an opportunity uh, to perhaps set these kinds of things up and have, have more dialogue and more conversation. So thank you all very much. Thanks to the audience. Thank to, thanks to Compton National staff for all the work that they did to get here. Um, go to www.compto.org. Um, that's where you'll find all the information um, in terms of membership and um, in terms of what Compto does and how you can get involved, um, as well as Compto social media. So um, that's comto.org. Um, we'll see you there. And um, thanks, thanks to everybody for for joining us. And before we before we sign off, I would just like to add that if you would specifically like to join our uh, Accessibility Advisory Council, you can send an email to info at compto.org uh, and uh, the National Office will uh, uh, will be happy to uh, to to respond and, and, and put you on our roster. Today's webinar covers a lot of the kinds of, of, uh, of subjects that we like to talk about on the council. We use the uh, meetings that we have as an opportunity for exchange of ideas to help solve problems, but most importantly, nothing about us without us. 
Um, we like to have people with disabilities and practitioners uh, like our panelists uh, who not only understand the law, appreciate where the ADA came from, but that are working every day to apply those rights uh, and, and all the body of knowledge that we've learned about accessibility over the last 30 years to make the quality of life better uh, for everyone. One thing I would add uh, is that uh, you know, a lot of times people, when they do not make provisions for accessibility, they really do not realize uh, just how powerful of a barrier they are putting up to diversity and inclusion. Um, you know, things like, you know, just simply accessible formats. Um, and then all the people who are looking for access to health care, one of the biggest threats to uh, the, the nation's health uh, has been no, uh, no transportation access to getting to healthcare facilities. And that crosses disability lines, low income lines, uh, and, and frankly, uh, uh, the racial disparity and inequities that we've been talking about. A lot of us live in the Title VI zone uh, where we're doing a lot of comparison uh, when changes to transit service are taking place, but that really needs to become second nature. So if all or any of these ideas excite you or get you fired up, we hope that you will join us. And before we go, um, I believe that Comto's chairman, Freddie Fuller, uh, is on the line and wanted to offer some closing comments. Christian, I don't think Freddie was able to get on, so you can wrap it up. Well, in that case, I'm going to thank Freddie for being here in spirit, and I hope all of you enjoyed our presentation today, and we're going to be looking uh, forward to hearing and seeing more of you at uh, future uh, Comto Accessibility Advisory Council uh, events and uh, at our meetings. Thank you for watching. Mm -hmm.